Okay, so this is lecture number 20 in the creation of an international sustainable civilization. This particular lecture continues from the last one. It's Mr. Marif, and he was discussing what kind of curriculum, what kind of holistic education he wants. I connected that to systems thinking. It's already given the set of lectures, it's connected with Aristotle's virtues and religious pluralism. So this particular lecture has to do with all the obstacles and additional comments uh, and the, the problem of trying to pass on uh, wisdom from the elder generation to the younger generation and yet giving the younger generation uh, opportunities to adapt that because of the evolution of culture. And the evolution of culture is just that it gets more technical and more sophisticated and more complex, but the same virtues and vices uh, still occur and they can poison and they can, they can always lead to any sort of developed culture committing suicide, okay? It, Athens was the most developed, uh, scientifically developed, intellectually developed, and they ended up reverting to authoritarianism. Germany in the 20th century was very technologically sophisticated. That's why they were able to kill so many Jews because they could, you know, figure out how to run the trains on time and how to run the gas ovens and all this stuff. So you could be technologically very savvy and smart and organized and mechanistic and all that and still be extremely wicked. So, so we have to link knowledge to wisdom. And that's what Maurif is interested in. Um, he wants Indonesia to develop, but develop as um, uh, within the context of ethics and religious pluralism and all of these Indonesian things. Um, all right, he wants a paradigm shift. How do you pass on a system of education for wisdom from the elders to the next generation? What are the biggest obstacles? All right. So the greatest enemy is the disease of ignorance, which produces poverty and backwardness. The most important jihad should be to drive the sickness out of the body and spirit of the Muslim Umrah. This requires changes in the paradigm of thinking from the quantitative, the numbers chase to the qualitative. It calls for pursuing quality in every domain, science, technology, the economy, social and moral spheres, and Islamic thinking. So the same is true in the US and it would be called Christian thinking. So even if the US separated church and state, we still, we're losing our democracy because uh, the Christianity that people profess is becoming more and more dualistic and corrupt. And so all of this is, is true, I'm sure in every country. We need to cultivate deep self-awareness to continually criticize ourselves plainly and objectively so we can enter a new era free from the false pride that has afflicted the Muslim Umat over the years. Every point Marif makes was also true of the Athenians. Socrates was always exposing their false pride and ignorance. These personal and social diseases are also very prevalent in the United States and I'm sure throughout the world. They prevent us from dealing with the destruction of the natural world and with each other. Um, how do you pass on wisdom? Marif is looking for serious young students who will study ancient Islam and apply it to current affairs. Quote, Indonesia longs for the appearance of serious young thinkers who are highly committed to remaining in the Indonesian milieu. The greatest challenge faced by Islamic studies is located in particular in the inadequate numbers of truly professional lecturers, that is those who are equally well-grounded in the classical Islamic literature and in the modern world, and who then deal with both of these intelligently and critically. And um, Marif has no interest in maintaining control over the next generation. He just wants to guide them he wants, he wants them 
to know things that he doesn't know. He wants them to synthesize Islam in a new way because he wants to preserve Indonesian well-being, economic development, and also their um, religious pluralism and humanism. Okay, in Plato's dialogue, Socrates is also looking for those youth who will learn and pass down the wisdom of the culture and adapt it to emerging circumstances. And um, it's clear when Socrates is talking to the younger generation that their parents are completely misreading the meaning of the tragedies, uh, that the tragedies show people behaving in extreme ways. And the point is to, you will be tempted to do that, don't do that, flush it out, it's a catharsis. But Plato's brothers are saying that their elders are telling them, you know, that Homer is advising them to go to these extremes, to be power hungry, um, to honor Agamemnon and these characters, which clearly uh, the poets did not intend to be honored. So the elder Plato's parents' generation and grandparents did not pass down the wisdom of the culture. They didn't believe in it. They didn't live that way. Um, and so this is a problem. The problem exists in every society today, particularly because of the powerful influence uh, of social media. Social media is just uh, eliminating, you know, any sort of ancient wisdom in favor of the latest whatever tweet. Um, because And other technology, which I said earlier was grabbing your attention, the, the, the marketing, what product, what is it they're looking for to tap into in, in human beings? Well, their attention or their fear or their fantasies. It's, it's really very primitive, primitive part of the brain. And um, it can lead, it can lead to some very dangerous places. Um, let's see, the social media is constructed to make us want to respond to instant messaging, whether it triggers pleasure or fear, never look at the broader underlying causes of what we experience, and then completely change the structure of our societies. Where will we get the next generation of systems thinkers in this era of cell phones and social media? Okay. Once the students are educated, how do you then, if you can educate students, they need to become the teachers Indonesia needs for the next generation of leaders. In this process, the role and quality of the teacher will be decisive. If this great philosophical idea can be realized within a period of time that's not too long, wisdom will return to the collective life of the Muslim community, whose rays will penetrate the collective life of the community of humankind. The modern world focused on the doctrine of cogito ergo sum, which is, to quoting from Descartes, which is overly reliant on the achievements of brain power, has long been silent on the culture of wisdom. Yeah, so that's a dualistic rationalism of the modern enlightenment. And it, it doesn't connect to culture, um, to the arts, to ancient wisdom. What the wisdom civilizations emphasize is not what Descartes emphasizes, but we just have to put them together. According to the Quran, the whatever, <laughs> Are those are those um, how we are those how we are uh, how are tilled with wisdom and virtue? He gives wisdom to whom he wills, and whoever has been given wisdom has certainly been given much good. Um, oh, <laughs> are those filled with wisdom and? Um, Okay, sorry. Filled with virtue and wisdom. All right. Creating a new paradigm. Marif writes, the mainstream as represented by the NU and Muhammadiyah, with all its various shortcomings, has nevertheless been a trademark for Islamic movements that are moderate, modern, open, inclusive, and instructive. This does not mean there are no scoundrels in this mainstream. 
Contemporary Indonesia is fortunate because these two big currents are not moving apart, but rather coming closer to complement each other's strengths and cover each other's weaknesses and shortcomings. So this means a lot to me because what I see as an outsider is that Islam has the most moderate Muslims. It has these two very large organizations. They're trying to educate uh, students from grade school on in moderate Islam. The world really needs this and it needs teachers, it needs students, it needs a whole culture where people agree that Islam is pluralistic and humanistic. Um, so I certainly hope that they're coming together. I don't know, you know, and it gets precarious sometimes, but I would hope that uh, Indonesian voters reward politicians that bring NU and Muhammadiyah together and not politicians that divide them. And I would hope that the leaders of NU and Muhammadiyah would not let that happen and they would call it out and they would hang together. No matter how much they might disagree, they will emphasize their common ground, just like at the UN. I know that is that Indonesia is a great supporter of the UN, so NU and Muhammadiyah should model that same kind of cooperation and unity and diversity that is modeled at the UN. As to the young intellectuals of the NU and Muhammadiyah, I hope they devote their innovative and creative thinking to an Indonesian Islam in the post muhammadiyah and post-NU paradigm. You know, he wants to bring them together in the next generation. I've often been in dialogue with and associated with young people in this mainstream. My conclusion is that they have a very open attitude, quite different from the elder generations. We have to understand that Muhammadiyah and NU are not religions, but rather movements to achieve the aims of Islam, which include the entire dimension of human existence and to uphold justice, brotherhood and community in pluralistic Indonesian society. So when the UN, when the Ethics in Action Working Group got together, they had different Muslim scholars and they picked a Sufi, a chaplain, a liberal arts, and then a highly respected scholar, just a more uh, exclusively academic. But they knew, you know, those people said there's many diverse voices. But even then, you know, they wouldn't say, oh yeah, in Indonesia, there's NU and Muhammadiyah, and that's another diverse voice in Islam. So, you know, we get myopic, we get um, really sort of, preoccupied or the only thing we know is what we're familiar with. And you have to step back and just kind of laugh about how seriously you might take things that really the rest of the world thinks is pretty insignificant. Um, in, in, Arkansas, in Arkansas alone, there I don't know if you know about the Baptist denomination. It's anti-intellectual. It tends to be um, very fundamentalist. There are actually 47 branches of Baptists in the state of Arkansas alone. And each one of them, the preacher thinks he knows everything about everything, right? About salvation and damnation and the meaning of life and the meaning of history and human nature. And all this. Obviously, they don't. They don't know anything. And yet people are willing to divide in 47 pieces uh, within one denomination there's probably at least 47 denominations or 47 religious traditions within the state of Arkansas. Um, I've had Baha'i, Mormons, Dudists, Satanists, pagans, neo-pagans, Wiccans. I mean, you name it. But um, in the past, you know, America has been that tolerant place. And now it's becoming less and less tolerant. You have to be Baptist, you have to be Southern Baptist, you have to be white Southern. I mean, it just is getting narrow and narrow and this is really a problem. It's undermining democracy, it's creating instability. So it's so important that Indonesians, that the NU and the Muhammadiyah come together, that the middle-aged and elder generation encourage the younger generation. They find a way 
to set up a curriculum that will bring these two groups together. And then they can lead in um, deciding, you know, arguing for one politician over another. Even if they disagree, they should disagree on very respectful grounds and not let those disagreements divide them. They shouldn't let NU and Muhammadiyah become tribe tribal or become associated with any one political party. They should hold all the leaders and all the parties accountable to a common standard of the, the common good. Okay, he has faith in the next generation. He's not a bitter old man. The potential within the NU and Muhammadiyah for guarding the integrity of the Indonesian nation is really extraordinary. I agree with that. And also the potential for all of these people to guard the integrity of religious pluralism and ancient humanism is also extraordinary. That the older leadership occasionally feels uncomfortable with the doings of the, these youth is nothing strange. After all, every progressive intellectual breakthrough is sure to create shock and possi possibly even suspicion, provided the ideas being offered stand on a sufficiently strong religious and rational foundation. However, the old order would quietly go along. We generally see this occurring because of the general generation gap in reading information and the scope of social intercourse. Young people are perhaps more ravenous and devouring new and fresh reading material, while the old cling to the treasury of classics, whose relevance to new developments is uncertain. So I would add that I don't know if the Pontifical Academy has master's and PhD programs, but there must be institutions, educational institutions in this world that have a curriculum related to what, what was being um, agreed upon at that, at that conference. And so, you know, for me, if I were, I think an Indonesian elder, I would try to find um, training that these, the next generation of Indonesian Muslims could get educated, get masters and PhDs in, this the kind of systems, virtue ethics, egalitarian, the, the kind of learning, the kind of writing, the kind of scholarship, the kind of examination of religious texts and history that um, brings everybody together. That would be, they could really not only lead Indonesia, well, they could lead Indonesia and prevent any sort of religious divisions they could also lead the world in showing how all of these things fit together. I hope this generation of intellectuals does not just busy itself with discourse and speeches while leaving the Indonesian nation to become increasingly fragile. Some of the intellectuals must enter into the power system with far reaching intentions to establish justice and to oppose all forms of tyranny against anyone without partiality. Plato also set up his academy to educate future leaders. They were not, most his students were not mostly going to sit and, and ponder with each other what Plato said or what he meant or parsing his dialogues the way that modern scholars do. Plato said the written word is not important. It's the spoken word, the word that you have in your psyche that you've internalized. The, the word that is who you are. So my constant commentaries on my writing here probably reveals more about my character or um, about how one should live one's life than the actual writing. I hope the writing is helpful, but um, Plato, th there's this huge difference between what you get rewarded for and paid for as a Plato scholar and what Plato's dialogues actually ask you to do. And he wanted to teach future leaders and he wanted to show them how they could preserve the, a free and open society and how they could destroy it, no matter what their position in society is. And um, that's what, so Marif, by wanting some of the intellectuals to go into politics was also 
what Plato would agree with. Plato even tried to go into politics or to advise um, the prince of one of the city-states, but it didn't go very well. And he sort of escaped with his life. But at least, you know, the story shows that he did care about um, getting politics correct. Having philosophical rulers, right? Uniting philosophy and politics. So passing on the cultural legacy to the next generation and preserving a free society. Mari's concerns are the concerns of any elder citizen, no matter what their positions were or how much power or influence they had. We should all keep reminding ourselves and each other that what we value most is the same, the preservation of what is best in our societies, the desire to work with others to create a global sustainable community based on cooperation. This will prevent us from using religion as a weapon to judge others or to be threatened by others. Uh, as college-educated citizens, especially in higher education, this is our greatest responsibility. And um, yeah, we have these organizations, we have the UN, we have a lot of opportunities to actually make good on this. So, um, so I'm just presenting one version of the philosophy, but because there's so many branches that that really belong to the trunk, there's just many parts of the trunk of the tree. The branches aren't really as much different as you would think. They appear different, but actually they're, this, they're different ways of saying the same thing. They're all aimed for the same goal. Um, it's just, we have to coordinate, we have to develop uh, masters and PhD programs that will focus on this sort of worldview. Um, and we have to do enough of them so that there is this um, synchronicity, so that there's uh, coming together and people will be able to have meaningful dialogues without being the outsider, without constantly being um, marginalized, ignored, having to fight for a voice. So I've, I've, I cannot find anybody in Plato or Aristotle that actually thinks about it the way I do. I doesn't mean they aren't there. It's just, it means that there's few enough so we can't seem to get together and develop enough of a culture that we could actually make a difference. So just like Marif, like Marif was, 70, 71, I think 70 when he wrote the book, like I'm 71. And Marif did have a lot more respect and more power and more. He was the head of Muhammadiyya, so than I have, but even then he gets discouraged, but he really has goodwill for the next generation. He tries to articulate what he thinks they need to know. He tries to encourage them. And so that's what I'm doing also. I would have liked to know him, but, you know, um, our paths did not cross. I'm hoping um, he died when he was 71. Now, because I live in this developed country and I've kept my health up, I hope, you know, I can have another 10 or 20 years and maybe I can connect to people and um, create a, a culture a whole network that then will last past me. <laughs> I won't just die, which, you know, everybody dies, but it would be nice to, um, you know, for someone to take the insights, whatever insights I've managed to, to gain over a lifetime and, and pass and articulate them in their own way and then pass them on to the next generation. I have grandchildren that will go to college in three years, I think. So it's getting to be this overlapping the generations, which is fascinating. I, I really like thinking about those things. <laughs>